it's nice to see uh, so many of you here, uh, particularly members of the Donut Club, which uh, Sam Jane loves to attend. Uh, I, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, introduction uh, in order to tell those of you who didn't know Dr. Chang uh, who he was. Uh, Dr. Chang attended St. John's University, which was a Western-style university in Shanghai, and then came to this country in 1948. He interned in Atlantic City, uh, did a residency at Montefiore in the uh, Bronx, then uh, was chief president, <coughs> excuse me, back in Atlantic City. Then he was unable to return to China due to the communist takeover in 49. It's, it's of interest that his father had uh, obtained a PhD, <coughs> excuse me, at the University of Chicago around 1920. Uh, Sam became a uh, gastroenterology fellow at uh, New England Medical Center associated with Tufts University in Boston. He remained on staff there until 1957. Uh, he met there the love of his life, Melvia Lee, now Melvia Lee Cheng, uh, who was a dietitian at New England Medical Center. He came here with Malcolm Stanley, uh, who headed the Division of Gastroenterology and in 1957 and remained at the university until entering private practice uh, in 1973. Uh, his professional attributes were an extremely high ethical standard, uh, thereby resulting in this, in this lectureship. He was an outstanding teacher, he had logical thought processes, he was disciplined and modest, he loved the ponies, and they loved Tangerage and Martinis. He had a great sense of humor, and here he's shown with uh, his older son Steve, uh, his wife Melvia, uh, younger son Jim, and daughter Cindy Crumpton. And with that introduction, I'll turn the program back over to Dr. David Dickens. Thank you. So That's much. great. Terrific. Synchronize them just a second. There we go. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today for the training lectureship, Dr. Joseph J. Finn. Dr. Finn is a colleague. He is also a, like myself, a president of a major organization, Ethics, and a personal friend. Dr. Finn is the E. William Davis, Jr., Professor of Medical Ethics and Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics at Lyle Cornell Medical College where he also serves as a professor of medicine as well as professor of public health and professor of medicine in psychiatry. He's the founding chair of the Ethics Committee of New York Secretary of Law for Air Medical School. He co-directs the consortium of advanced study of brain injury. He graduated from Wesleyan University and then from Cornell University Medical College. He completed his residency and fellowship in internal medicine at the New York Hospital of Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Finns is author of over 250 publications and is co-author of the landmark 2007 Nature paper describing the first use of deep brain simulation in the minimally conscious state. The title of this talk today is Neuroethics and Disorders of Consciousness When Rights Come to Mind. As a reminder, all of these talks, the Chang Lectureship, Sambal Lectureship, and Gein's Lectureship are all available approximately two to three weeks after they are given on iTunes University. So if you just put in Louisville Bioethics, it will take you to that website. You'll be able to download it for your viewing pleasure at home, on your iPod, or on your iPhone, or iPad. I want you to give a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Joseph Kett. Thank you, David. OK, great. Thank you all very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to meet uh, the Chang family and to be able to give a lectureship in, in honor of your, of your husband, your, your, your father. Uh, uh, it's just an extraordinary privilege. Uh, I love coming to Louisville. I've never seen the ponies, but maybe next time. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really, uh, it's great. We had a great conversation earlier. And what I'd, what I'd like to do is, is to talk to you about 
um, this new area of medicine about disorders of consciousness. And, and, um, and I think it's in the spirit of your, of your husband's work, who was somebody who was very patient-centered, very concerned about, about patients and families, and trying to ameliorate uh, suffering. And what I want to do is, is share some work that I've done um, interviewing families that have come to Weill Cornell um, who, for studies of disorders of consciousness. These are patients in, the, in, the, in the, what are called the minimally conscious state, it's a state I'll describe in more detail in a few moments, just above the vegetative state. But the important thing to remember as we start off are these are people who are conscious and who are aware of their environment, although they may not always appear so. These families have come <coughs> for, for studies that we conduct at Cornell and Rockefeller to understand mechanisms of recovery using fMRI, PET scans, EEGs. And what I'd like to do is to share some findings of what the families have to say about their experiences. And this will be forthcoming in a book that will be published in 2014 from Cambridge University Press called Rights Come to Mind, Brain Injury Ethics and the Struggle for Consciousness. And, and despite the amazing science that I'm going to describe in a few moments, um, these families uh, describe a healthcare system that's disinterested uh, in their, in their loved ones. Uh, these are patients that, that um, experience a, a stereotypic trajectory of, of neglect and, and nihilism. After brilliant care in the emergency room and the neurosurgical suites that saved these lives, these patients are often relegated to what is euphemistically called custodial care, uh, often misdiagnosed. Um, the, the healthcare system looks at brain injury as a kind of a static thing. You're, you're injured, and you're forever, ever uh, lost in space when, in fact, uh, the possibility for recovery uh, is there. This is, this is in, in spite of the fact of growing scientific evidence that's coming out of fields like medicine, physiatry, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, neuropsychology as well. If people, uh, when they're in the acute care setting in the hospital, um, they're prompted to have decisions to withhold or withdraw care, what I think prematurely, um, and, uh, and sometimes even to donate organs. Um, you know, Trish Mealy, who was, a, who was a Central Park jogger who wrote that book, uh, her family was approached uh, to be an organ donor. Uh, but she, of course, went on to recover and, and write the book. Um, and sometimes uh, they're discharged while they're medically unstable to places that can't handle uh, the ongoing complications of brain injury. Now, just so you know that I'm not making this up and this is true, I've got two pictures here. Of, pe of real people, and I should add that I have HIPAA permission uh, to, to use their names, and this was all IRB approved to be able to do these interviews in a kosher fashion. The top picture uh, is Terry Wallace and his, and his mother, Angelie, uh, and they're from Arkansas, and you might have heard about him. He was the man who woke up, uh, quote unquote, from a vegetative state after 19 years being diagnosed as such uh, in, in early, in 2003. Uh, he had been in the minimally conscious state all the time. And on the bottom part of, of, the, of the screen is, is Maggie and her, um, a Worthen and her mother, Nancy. Uh, this book is also a mother-daughter book. And it's about, about Maggie, who was a senior at Smith College. And after she had taken her exams and had finished up all her work, and they were just hanging out waiting to graduate, uh, she has a, a brain injury. Um, that leaves her um, um, in, in a, in a, in a, in a, with this, this disorder of consciousness. And here she's with her mother uh, as well. So these are real people who have suffered mightily, and I'm going to try and tell you their story, as well as the science of, of this work. And I want to start by trying to explain the paradox. And the paradox is why, despite this amazing science, have we looked at these people as if they're essentially dead? As, this, as if they, they're, not, they're, not, they're not entitled to any kind of benefit. And what's important to realize is the inter sort of woven history of severe brain injury and the history of the right to die in American politics and American bioethics. Ever since the 1960s, um, uh, American bioethics has been predicated upon the notion of self-determination, uh, the right to make decisions, the right to have autonomy. Remember the book, My Body, Myself, um, and the, the ability to control the manner and timing of one's death. And this right to die evolved as a negative right to be left alone. And it was established in the case of this young woman. Anybody recognize this picture? Okay, it's Karen Ann Quinlan. And this is, this is Karen Ann Quinlan who, who was at a party, had a presumptive drug overdose, 
Um, interestingly, she might have also had a eating disorder like Terry Schiavo did, and she was, she was uh, left in a, in a permanent vegetative state. And Judge Hughes, who was a New Jersey uh, a chief of the Supreme Court, um, said that it was okay to take her off the ventilator because of her permanent loss of her cognitive sapient state. And he predicated this, this uh, decision based on the testimony of my professor, uh, Dr. Fred Plum, who's up in the top picture in a picture from 1976 when the trial took place. And Dr. Plum and a neurosurgeon named Brian Jeanette, um, who was known for the Glasgow Coma Scale, all right, very famous amongst neurosurgeons, together had coined the phrase the persistent vegetative state, a state, you know, a syndrome without an, a name, they described it. And they described it as wakeful unresponsiveness. Talk about parsimonious phraseology. Wakeful unresponsiveness. Eyes are open, but nobody's home. And the vegetative state is somebody who eyes are open, they have sleep-wake cycles, they look randomly around the room, but they're not making contact with anything. And it's basically um, the, the recovery of the brainstem without higher cortical function. And Judge Hughes, in his landmark decision in Quinlan, which really launched the right to die um, movement, uh, said, it was indicated by Dr. Plum, <clears throat> that the brain works in essentially two ways, the vegetative and the sapient. We have no hesitancy in deciding that there's no external compelling interest of the state which should compel Karen to endure the unendurable. Interestingly, people in the vegetative state don't endure anything, but he was kind of talking about it as if it was a terminal cancer or a terminal disease, only to vegetate a few more measurable months with no realistic possibility of returning to any semblance of cognitive or sapient life. So Judge Hughes allowed for her ventilator to be removed. But of course she didn't die because she had an intact brainstem. Now the sidebar in this, and I think the statute of limitations are up on it, is that Judge Hughes did not order that the ventilator be removed. Dr. Plum did it as part of his neurologic exam. And he was asked to come and see Karen Ann Quinlan. And one day Dr. Plum told me, he said, Joe, you know, I knew that she would breathe when they took her off the ventilator. And I said, how did you, you know, he was shorter than me, but I looked up to him. So I said, Dr. Plum, that's a joke, you should, you know. I said, Dr. Plum, how did you know? He said, because I took her off the ventilator as part of my neuro exam. And the reason he did that was to be sure she wasn't brain dead. Because someone who was brain dead would not be able to trigger the respiration. So it was part of his judicially ordered neurologic exam. But in fact, he did take her off the ventilator as part of that evaluation. This has accelerated over the ensuing 40 years, um, this right to die. Um, and it began in the vegetative state, but it hasn't ended there. And physicians have really been acculturated to be respectful of this right to die. And the vegetative state became the ultimate in medical futility, that nothing can or should be done, that these injuries are immutable. Um, in fact, even growing up at Cornell, um, you know, my image of the vegetative brain, of, of brains like this, was of gelatinous gel. Reading the, the New England Journal of Medicine report of uh, Karen and Quinlan's autopsy in the early 90s, you know, she had what's called hydrocephalus ex vacuo. The, the ventricles expanded the cortex thin. There it was a lot of fluid. The brain weight was half of a normal brain. Uh, and it was this, this brain that was impossibly, and, and unable to do anything. And it, couldn't, it couldn't do any functional uh, activities. And this notion of the vegetative state held in the Cruz Ann case in 1991, and in the Shivo case. And it's interesting, because as this was all happening in bioethics, some of us working in medicine, in neurology, physiatry, were beginning to see these people who looked vegetative to all the world, but every once in a while, they'd track you in the room. Or they'd say a word. Or they'd grasp for something. And it turned out there was another brain state lurking within the permanent vegetative state, a new diagnostic category called the minimally conscious state. And we talk in neurology of having a neglect syndrome, like if you have a parietal lobe lesion, you don't see half of your visual field. For the longest time, we've had a societal neglect syndrome for this population, and they've been out of our gaze. And what I do, what I do is talk to you about this population. Now, these are people who are conscious. But the behaviors that, that demonstrate that they're conscious are episodic and intermittent. So what happens if, Dr. if David 
has a loved one who's had a brain injury, who's in, who, in a minimally conscious state in a nursing home or something, and says, Dr. Finns, I want you to see my son. You know, yesterday he said something, or yesterday he reached for something. The biology of the minimally conscious state is that that behavior will not be repeated. It's like a flickering light bulb, okay? The fact that it flickers means that the circuit can work, but it doesn't flicker all the time. So chances are, I go in, I see the, the family member, and I say, well, you know, poor David and his family, they're just in denial. They're just not, they haven't, they haven't caught up with the situation. Um, they haven't accepted the tragedy that has befallen them, and I don't, I, I, I ascribe it to their wishful thinking instead of the possibility that this person is actually in a different brain state. But in fact, there is this brain state. Now, I've just given you a lot of phrases, a lot of words, vegetative, minimally conscious, and I just want you to now step into the, into the shoes of family members. No one really prepares to have a brain injury in their family. You know, we know about cancer, we know about these other things, but, but families are overwhelmed by this new language. Lee Woodruff, whose husband, Bob Woodruff, who was an ABC uh, News uh, uh, anchorman briefly before he was injured in, in Iraq, who I've had the, the privilege of meeting, in her book, you know, she says, you know, um, you know, in an instant, there's this sudden immersion in language. One of the people we interviewed, who was a bond trader in Boston, said, let's face it, this is complicated, a complicated area, and I know a lot about the bond market, but I don't know much about the brain. And I think this imposes an obligation upon all of us who work with families during this very acute, very stressful time to try to explain what we mean and use our clinical power wisely because they're suffering uh, from a profound knowledge deficit. But, but that's what should happen. But this is what actually happens. And this is a recommendation from the American uh, Neurological Association, from Dr. Vidjix, who runs the neuro ICU at the Mayo Clinic, and these are his recommendations from a paper entitled The Family Conference, End of Life Guidelines at Work for Comatose Patients. The attending physician of a patient with a devastating neurological illness will have to come to terms with the futility of care. Those families who are unconvinced should be explicitly told they should have markedly diminished expectations for what ICU can accomplish and that withdrawal of life support or abstaining from performing complex interventions is more commensurate with the neurologic st uh, status. This is a, a paper that's remarkable, and I urge you to read it so you know that I'm not taking it out of context, but this is a global statement about, about the utility of ongoing care for people who are still comatose. And what's the definition of being in a coma? Coma is a self-limited, eyes-closed state, and it lasts for 10 to 14 days. We often do not know how patients are going to do until they get out of their coma and begin to declare themselves. So making this recommendation so early on while people are still in a coma is to me highly, uh, highly not prudential. Here's, here's, a, here's a transcript from one of the mothers who, was in, who, who we, were, we were privileged to interview. This is a young man um, who had just enlisted into the Marine Corps and was about to be deployed for basic training when he gets hit as a pedestrian walking the streets of Philadelphia. And the mother says, and actually, I had a neurologist <coughs> tell me, quote, your son is basically just an organ donor now. And I said, when did that happen? And the mother said, within the first 72 hours. And she said, that the doctor said, well, he doesn't have the reflexes of a frog. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I said, like, really? He doesn't have the reflexes of a frog? I couldn't believe that I had heard what I, had heard, but we, we have the transcript, you can listen to it. And the mother said, of a frog. He said, you should really just consider him being an organ donor. That's the best thing you can do for your son. And I said, the mother, I completely disagree with you. I'm not gonna make him an organ donor. Go back in there and do the best you can. Now, why does something like this happen? Was this a bad doctor? Was he a bad guy? He wasn't a great communicator, but was he a bad guy? And I think what, what happened is that for most of us who are not neurologists, and I'm an internist, I like to say in New York, I'm just a simple country doctor, but that doesn't work here. <laughs> uh, that, again, you should laugh at that, you know, come on. You're, you're a little tight. I mean, I, people said that, you know. Um, so so we, we often look at, at loss of consciousness as a terminal condition, end-stage cancer, end-stage heart disease, end-stage uremia. All these things cause hypercalcemia, uremia, uh, the loss of consciousness. We see this as the end game of a disease process, and 75% of patients who are made DNR, do not resuscitate, are made so by surrogates 
when patients lose their capacity, lose their consciousness, lose their ability to interact with others. In brain injury, the process begins with a loss of consciousness. It doesn't end there. Some of these people could go off and become brain dead. Some of these people, however, could recover completely. So we've, we have a kind of a misanalogy to the loss of consciousness, and for people who are not really thinking about it, it can look worse than it really is. And this could be the start of a recovery, unlike a terminal loss of consciousness. Now this, this debate about whether brain injuries can improve or not is an old debate. And it goes back to Hippocrates. How many have heard of Hippocrates? How many have heard of Hippocrates? Okay. <laughs> Equal number. Um, well, Hippocrates was a great you know, Greek physician uh, from the hometown where David Dukas is, uh, the island of Kos, where David's uh, ancestors are from. I learned yeah, yesterday driving uh, through the hills of uh, Tennessee. Uh, I'm sorry, Kentucky? I'm sorry, it's, it's all the same for me. It's hard, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's an honest mistake, folks. You know, I'm, I, I am what I am. Um, anyway, so Hippocrates wrote that all brain injuries are invariably fatal. And this is a painting um, that, that is the, the, the ceiling of the Montreal Neurologic Institute in Montreal, designed by Wilder Penfield, who was a great neurosurgeon and neurologist who founded the MNI. He was a student of Harvey Cushing and uh, William Osler, just great lineage. And what you see in this painting is the early representation of, of the brain in the hieroglyphics, the ram's head in the middle. Around this, these are Golgi cells, and around it in the Greek letters is, as translated by Osler's nephew himself, a statement by Galen, a later great physician who disputes the Hipp Hippocratic aphorism that says, but I have seen the injured brain healed. I am totally in the camp of Galen, not Hippocrates. And I want you to begin to think that brain injury is mutable, that these brains do change over time. We have a physiatrist in the audience. He makes a career out of watching this happen, and all of us should be attentive to this, this reality. Now, Fred Plum, this is an earlier picture of Dr. Plum, um, talked about in the mid-70s, I looked at his archives from the history of medicine, also study history, it's important. Um, he, he had uh, studied 100 patients, and he said, you know, we can, by 24 hours, we can tell those who will not recover it should be above a vegetative level, who will do well? And then he says, critically, this leaves a middle group for whom more information is needed, but we're presenting every effort to treat must be made to know their maximal potential and how to judge their early signs. The point is that there's this middle group, these people, that, 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 that it's not just about futility, it's about utility, the people who might get better. We call this today risk stratification. The poster child for this is Terry Wallace. 39-year-old Arkansan had been in a coma since 1984, which we know is not right because coma is a self-limited two-week thing, but that's how it was described in the newspapers, when in July 2003, he wakes up in his nursing home. His first words were, Mom, then he said, Pepsi. I'm a Coke drinker, but he said, Pepsi. Over the weeks, he gained greater fluency. He was stuck in 1984, not the George Orwell novel, but in his mind, it was 1984. Ronald Reagan was still president. A review of his behaviors, however, suggests that about three or four months after his injury, the family was making observations that clearly suggested he was in the minimally conscious state. He was not vegetative for all these years. He was minimally conscious. He had been unassessed by a neurologist for these 19 years because his family was told that it wouldn't matter, it wouldn't make a difference, it wouldn't be paid for, uh, he had no scans. He developed contractures, um, and, uh, and when he began to talk, his body was in worse shape than his mind, and he had to have tendon releases and other things. Now, it's, it's interesting because I was trying to get Terry basic rehabilitation services from his, from, through uh, uh, HSS, uh, and uh, we, uh, Health and Human Services, and, uh, and, we, and I, was, I was calling his congressman, who's Marion Barry, not the one you're thinking of, but Marion Barry, who was the, the, con the congressman from the first congressional district in Arkansas, who was a pharmacist. And I needed his social security number, that is Terry's social security number. And I called up Mrs. Wallace and I said, you know Terry's social security number? She says, hold on. And she says, Terry, what's your social security number? And I hear this voice in the background and she tells me, and I write it down, 
so I can help with the constituent services. And I said, Mrs. Wallace, I just have to ask you a question. I said, was that, was that Terry who told you the Social Security number? And she said, yep, first time he told us. Thought it was wrong, we looked it up, he was right. And Terry's getting better and better. He now knows the song, bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? Now some people would think that was an improvement, others would disagree. <laughs> but the important point is that song didn't exist when he was injured. So he's laying down new memory. He's getting improved postural control. Um, and as recently as 2009, he was at a party um, and he turned to his mother spontaneously. He said, Mama, life is good. Now what's remarkable about Terry is, is diffusion tensor imaging studies that were done uh, by, by my colleagues uh, at Cornell, uh, Henning Voss, Nico Schiff, and others, that was on the cover of the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And I, 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 I need a pointer in the light, but I'll just try to walk you through it. Um, if you look at, can you see that pointer? Yes? So you see this red thing here? That's the beginning of his corpus callosum. And that corpus callosum should go all the way back um, because, all the way this way. But you see how severely injured he was that he's lost the middle part of his corpus callosum. Those are red fibers go left to right, side to side. But what you see conveniently circled in the top frame there are these crisscrossing fibers in his parietal occipital lobe. Has, that, has anyone seen that before in normal anatomy? No. This is axonal sprouting in his brain happening 19 years after his injury, okay, which shows new connections between existing neurons. And then 18 months later, in the second scan below, you actually see that that, that stuff in the parietal occipital lobe has disappeared, has been pruned, and you see down here in the bottom left-hand frame, that little thing in the bottom in the cerebellum, new fibers. So you see new connections between existing uh, neurons. And this is axonal sprouting and pruning. And you know what's great about that? This is how our brains develop. This is how we connect to our brains in, 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 in normal developmental biology. So the adolescent, the last thing that gets connected is the frontal cortex. They sprout, they connect, they prune. So what's conceivably happening here is that we're using a developmental mechanism, not we, you know, like nature, is using a normal uh, developmental process to repair injured, bra injured brains after a long period of latency. Say, why haven't we seen this before? We haven't seen this before because no one has lived this long before with this kind of injury that heretofore would have killed people. But he survived, and he was kept alive. And, and, and there's some work that suggests that stem cells may be retrievable and part of this story. It's the molecular biology part of this story uh, as well as the systems biology. So what this shows is that brain injuries are not static, they're not immutable. Galen was right, I have seen the injured brain heal. And so have you. Now, despite that, we have the lights back on, we get letters like this from Marion Barry writing to Mrs. Wallace, thanking her for her, her concern about getting future rehabilitation services for Terry. <clears throat> Still, his family is providing these services. And here's a picture of, 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 of Terry Wallace and his mother from a paper that we wrote in the uh, Dana Press back in 2003. He's looking away, his eyes are open, uh, but he's actually aware. Now, to, to begin to just put all this together in a way that, that I hope will be useful, um, um, these are the pathways to recovery. A person has a coma, loss of consciousness, eyes closed, self-limited state. The brainstem recovers in isolation. <coughs> they move into the vegetative state. Uh, we don't describe it as persistent or permanent, um, but some people would say at a month it becomes persistent. At three months, it becomes permanent um, after anoxic brain injury, oxygen starvation, or 12 months after traumatic brain injury, and after that, you have no recovery. Now the difference that just is a, it's worth noting is that you can have different ways of getting into the vegetative state. These are five brains that we published in Brain, uh, that's the journal, um, of people who are in the vegetative state using uh, metabolic studies. <clears throat> and you can see that in, in panels D and E, people have had anoxic brain injury, the, the metabolic rate is exceedingly low. Um, in A, B, and C, with traumatic brain injury, there's some areas, some pockets where the injuries 
are, are not there and the metabolic rates are near normal. All these people are vegetative. Um, however, the global nature of anoxic brain injury allow you to predict that recovery will not occur after three months, whereas traumatic brain injury needs a longer period of time because there's more cognitive reserve and it's more, uh, it's more patchy than, than, than consistent. I also want you to notice uh, the, the panel A, where a person seems to have a lot of cortex left. By the way, these are, this is the cortex for the lay people in the audience over here, and here's the brain stem. And the, and the thalamus. And what you see here, the central part of the brain, is if you have a surgical strike or surgical injury in your thalamus, you cannot integrate your brain function. The thalamus is to the brain what Hartsfield Airport is to Delta Airlines in Atlanta. You know, it's the hub. It, it, the planes can be flying, but you can't get there from here if you don't go through Atlanta. And that's how the brain is organized. If you don't go through the thalamus, you're not going anywhere. You're stuck in the cortex. You can't integrate your brain. So going back to this picture, you'll understand why there's a three or 12 months difference between anoxia and traumatic brain injury. The only caveat for the clinicians in the room is therapeutic hypothermia from my cardiac arrest, which has changed the picture, and those people do much better. Not as good as traumatic, but not as bad as anoxic because the hypothermia, the diving reflex response, actually preserves cortical function. Now, what happened to somebody like Terry Wallace? Well, you know, he has his injury, uh, and, and I interviewed Mrs. Wallace at great length in the book, and there's a whole chapter about them. Um, he has his injury, he's in the vegetative state, actually is, goes to a nursing home. And during that period of time, right here, he has what I call the surreptitious recovery but he's in, the, he's in the minimally conscious state and nobody notices it because he's in a low acuity place with nursing home doctors. The fancy doctors at the, at, the, at the medical center said he's vegetative and they're seeing these episodic behaviors and for all the reasons we just described, no one's gonna believe it. So they go undiagnosed in the minimally conscious state and they stay there for years, months, years, decades until they emerge from the minimally conscious state and start talking. Then you go, well, they couldn't possibly have been vegetative. They had to be minimally conscious all that time. Whoops, okay. These are the criteria uh, for the minimally conscious state. They came online in 2002. These are actually aspen trees, a picture I took in aspen. Um, and the, the first author is uh, Joe Giacino, who's our colleague, uh, and, and other notable people from uh, physical medicine, uh, and, and, and neurology. Uh, um, and I, again, I want to do a shout out for our physiatrist colleague here. If you could raise your hand for those students, medical students in the room, this is a real up and coming field. You know, it's physical medicine rehabilitation is really where a lot of the most important work in, in brain injury is happening along with neurology and neurosurgery. So to compare Terry Schiavo and Terry Wallace, you've got a picture, uh, remember Terry Schiavo, right? Tale of two cities, tale of two Terry's, pardon me. Um, Terry Wallace looking away, cheap black and white picture because it wasn't Time Magazine. Here, Terry Shara Shavo seeming to look at her mother, uh, but she's, her, she's, we know she's blind from her autopsy and we know she couldn't see because of her, her injury. She had anoxic brain injury in 1990. He had a traumatic injury. We know the prognosis is better for traumatic. She's permanently vegetative. He was minimally conscious. She was evaluated by 22 or so different courts um, and felt to be in the vegetative state. She actually had experimental deep brain stimulation in a Medtronic trial in San Francisco in the early 90s with no effect. And she's in this wakeful, unresponsive state, reflexive, static, and has a brain that's, I'll describe as disintegrated. That is, it's not working as a unity, as I described before, not using the thalamus as its kind of hub, disintegrated. Terry Wallace, in contrast, minimally conscious, um, not evaluated for years, has these episodic evidence of awareness, continues to improve, emerged in 2003, and continues uh, to, get, to get better. On the top of the screen, Carolyn Schnackers and colleagues had, had did a study that shows that 41%, just, just listen to this one figure and it should make you sick to your stomach, 41% of nursing home patients with a diagnosis of a traumatic brain injury who are diagnosed in the vegetative state 
are actually on closer examination minimally conscious. Huge, huge diagnostic error which we would never accept if we were talking about leukemia or lymphoma or a variation of, uh, of heart disease, but we tolerate it here. Now, what I want you to think about is not to be so categor categorically nihilistic about these patients. Get over that disanal the, the analogy with loss of consciousness of medical care and realize that patients can get better, but not to be overly optimistic. 77% of patients in anoxic coma will be dead or in the permanent vegetative state. 50% of TBI comas um, <coughs> will die, but 50% will not die or be permanently vegetative. But the, the amazing statistic from um, uh, Dr. Nakasaki uh, Richardson down at Tampa uh, that was just reported in neurotrauma last year is that 20% of, of, of people who have a TBI coma Will, have fun will regain functional independence. So these are more encouraging numbers than most people would think. In, in Stupor and Coma, the, the book about, about brain injury that I was privileged to write, the concluding part about, about ethics and, and all, I suggest a term called term time delimited prognostication. And that is, don't take a patient day two or three and make a global statement unless you know, it's, it's un unequivocally clear the person is going to die. Give the family landmarks based on the first month, the first three months, and you'll be more and more accurate. It's kind of like predicting you know, where the hurricane is going to land when you're all the way out here. You don't know if it's going to land in Meridian, Mississippi uh, or not. Or at your, it, when you get closer, you'll know. You'll know where it's going. And so what you do is you want to decrease the cone of uncertainty and be clearer uh, about um, about where you're going. The most important thing, though, to do is to exclude MCS patients who um, are, are responsive uh, uh, in, in, uh, from those who are, who are vegetative, who are not. Now, what happens if people um, uh, are in the hospital is, is they have this risk of premature withdrawal licensing treatment, risk of misdiagnosis, length of state pressures, premature discharge, medical necessity is a real, real problem. Medical necessity, have you heard, have you heard medical, what medical necessity is? Medical necessity is people have to demonstrate overt progress to, get to, to continue to get rehabilitation services. And in brain injury, people may not demonstrate the improvement. The improvement may be in their head, but they may not manifest it, manifest it behaviorally. And so people get denied services and they end up in, in chronic care and they get shuffled off to custodial care. And no one is immune from this. No one is immune from this. Um, uh, Bob Woodruff um, himself, with all the power of ABC News and Mickey Mouse and Walt Disney, uh, was in a subacute unit at the Bethesda Naval Hospital when, um, when one, of the, one of the folks there you know, said he's not responding to the doctors on command, he won't do anything for them, we probably need to move him out of Bethesda in a week or two but since he was not from Maryland, he could not go to the, those state facilities. He had to go back to New York, um, but he had to go somewhere until he is more awake. His wife, Lee Woodruff, um, is, who's, who you want to have as your wife if you have a brain injury, <laughs> said, damn the doctors and their predictions and caution. This is my husband. Somewhere inside that hurt and broken head, he knew me. He loved me too, but he was scared and confused. And about three or four days later, she walks into the room after he has a restless night, and he says to her, hey, sweetie, where have you been? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Where have we been for this population? Um, and Bob Woodruff has continued to improve, and he's back on, back on television uh, and, doing, and doing shows. The most heart-wrenching story was somebody I did not get to meet, uh, but Don Herbert. Don Herbert was a fireman in Buffalo, who in December 29, 1995, was in a, was in a house fire. <clears throat> it was initially thought he had anoxic brain injury because he was in a fire. But closer examination of the medical record, which is so important, was he got hit on the head with a beam and his face mask was right near his face. So he was probably breathing a lot hot, you know, oxygen during that thing and he had more of a traumatic brain injury than an anoxic brain injury. In early 1996, he has some rare speech. And then he kind of goes down, and he's, he's seemingly vegetative. His wife, uh, Linda Herbert, um, you know, writes all the major medical centers around the country about her husband 
could they do something for her? And she basically gets no, no response. Then, in 2005, a very earnest physiatrist who was making the rounds of, of Don Herbert's nursing home gives him a mix of, of, of psychostimulants, uh, 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 Parkinson's drugs, we don't really know for sure what it was, and one day something dramatic happens. Linda Herbert's driving her car and she gets a call from the nurses. And the nurses are the hero in the book. And the nurses say, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta come here because Don is talking. So Linda calls up her son, her 13-year-old son, who last interacted with his father when he was four years old, the last of four kids, his best little buddy, and this is what happens. Don Herbert's incredulous when his little buddy, Nicky, calls up. Herbert says, this isn't Nicholas, he's a baby, he can't talk. Nick responds to his dad, I can talk. Do you know how old I am? He tells him, I'm 13. Don, who was a fireman, responds with a vernacular, holy dot, dot, dot. <laughs> The, the response encapsulates all the missed years, his personality. The conversation concludes with Don telling his son he loves him. Imagine that after, after nine years. Later, Linda asked Nikki how Don sounded, and the little boy says to his mother, and reminding her, I don't know. I can't remember ever hearing him speak before. Uh, for 16 hours, Don is back online. He's blind. He had. He had cortical blindness from some degree of anoxia in his occipital cortex. Um, but when his fireman friends come in and he hears their voice, he knows exactly who they are. He remembers exactly who he is. And he feels a father's guilt. He says, I've been gone a long time. A couple of days later, he's walking around. He falls. He gets an aspiration pneumonia. And he was to come to Cornell for scanning and studies, but he eventually died. And so we have Don Herbert, Terry Wallace, and the tragedy of the MCS, the minimally conscious state. And it's a complicated little statement here, but it, it says there, there's a low correlation coefficient between the duration of MCS and outcome measures suggests that prognostic statements based on length of time someone is in its MCS cannot be made with confidence. Turning that into English, you know, we say in medicine, the longer you're sick, the worse it's going to be and the less likely it is you'll recover. Once you get into MCS, it, it doesn't seem to work that way. And we have no way of knowing who, who, is in, who are in MCS will actually recover and emerge and, re, and regain speech. And yet we pay for it as if we knew. And, I, and I, I won't belabor that, but I have this paper from last year, and the punchline is brains recover by biological standards, not reimbursement criteria. <laughs> Would you like to write that down? <laughs> Um, so, I'll conclude by telling you one, because we're running quicker than I thought, um, with, a, with, with one study that we did, uh, which I think, you know, gives us hope. Um, we, we wrote a paper at the Institute of Medicine uh, talking about late recovery from the minimally conscious state, and it might be there a way to accelerate recovery, foment recovery, um, cause recovery, and there have been a number of things that have happened since this paper was published. Our work in 2007, uh, it was published in Nature, which I'll talk about, using deep brain stimulation, the kind of electrodes that are used in Parkinson's disease, stimulating the thalamus, remember I told you how important the thalamus is, to cause cortical integration, and I'll tell you about, about that story. There's been a randomized clinical control trial using amantadine, the flu drug, to actually accelerate the pace of recovery uh, in disorders of consciousness. And there's been other work using um, uh, zolpidem or Ambien uh, that can actually work in other, in other uh, patients. Our study was a 38-year-old man who had uh, a really bad, had been assaulted in New Jersey. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and his Glasgow coma scale was three, which is as low as it can be without, without being dead. Um, about two to three months after his injury, he had, he had sequenced the minimally conscious state and uh, he was admitted to our study four years after his injury um, and he had had a stable baseline for 180 days and we put the, the, st the uh, stimulator into the chest, we connected the electrodes in the, in the operating room uh, and, um, and what you see here uh, looks, looks quite horrific because it's, it's on, a, on a regular x-ray, uh, not, a, uh, not a, a CAT scan, not a fMRI because of the danger of the filaments. But these are, these are basically the tracks 
of the of the electrodes, and and it just reflection the black area is reflection on the on the thin filament. It does it's not that wide a, a tract? It's very small microfilament. But um, we had a six month uh, double blind crossover study with stimulation on both sides, and the patient had increased cognitively mediated behaviors in language. He was able to say six word sentences. He was able to answer questions. He was able to say the first 16 words of the Pledge of Allegiance. He was able to go shopping with his mother. He was able to tell his mother he loved her. Before this, he was unable to speak at all and could only gesture sometimes. He had improved limb control, and for the first time since his injury, he was able to eat by mouth and not by peg. He was able to, to masticate control his secretions. And it was the first evidence that DBS can promote late recovery from severe TBI. And, 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 we, and I share this with you um, uh, with humility. It's really progress in the face of, of ignorance. It's the first of many, many steps. Uh, Lewis Thomas, we were talking about Lewis Thomas earlier. Um, uh, 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 one of our friends is the Lewis Thomas professor at Cornell, but Lewis Thomas was a great physician and he talked about halfway technologies, halfway technologies. And the DBS is a halfway technology. It's not how we're going to end up treating these people, but it's going to elucidate mechanisms of how we can do better and better and better. The, the, um, the iron lung was a halfway technology. The ventilator is a halfway technology until we get a treatment for cystic fibrosis. That's genetic. These are all halfway technologies um, that, that ameliorate but do not eliminate uh, the condition. But this halfway technology, this deep brain stimulator, for me was, was, was really about agency. We talk about deus ex machina. This is where I'll con conclude this because I really want time for conversation. It was agency ex machina. One day, we're doing the stimulation parameters for this patient, and <clears throat> it's a long, hot summer day, and the trial's over. And there are, four, there are four prongs on each of these stimulators, and you can change the circuit size, you can change the amplitude um, and the frequency, so there, there are a multitude of cha changes you can make. And the patient is, is getting tired. So one of the physiatry guys there, not a doc, but one of the physiatrists, said, you know, physical therapy guy says to someone, do you want to stop? You're getting tired? And, um, and, and the patient says, yeah. Now when I wrote the ethics consent policy for this, this study years before, I wrote in the policy that, 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 that if a patient ever had the restoration of functional communication, we would have to ask him for his ongoing consent to participate in the study. And we were at the Cornell Faculty Club, and my colleagues looked at me and they said, Joe, you know, we should be so lucky, you're crazy, but if you ethics guys have to put that kind of stuff in, you know, go ahead, put it in. So I said that would only, because the whole goal was to restore functional communication, to give these people voice, right? To tap into the residual cognitive functioning that is still perhaps there, but just waiting to come out. So, this guy, patient, says he didn't want to continue with that day's activities. And the physical therapist stopped. And we all stopped. And we respected his no. It wasn't at the level of a, of a, of a, dis, of a, of a, a refusal of treatment, but it was at the level of a, of a dissent. And so in a sense, we restored his degree of agency. He became self-determining and able to direct his care. And to me, that was, that was really the highlight uh, of, of, this, of the story. I, I have much more to say, but let me just sum up by saying, I think um, this population uh, is going to be the next wave of our civil rights thinking. These are people with disabilities. These are people who are conscious, who are in nursing homes, who are, who are mistaken as being permanently unconscious, but they're there. They have, they have some awareness of life of, uh, of others. And we owe them so much better. I'll close with an anecdote involved Terry Wallace. Terry was in a nursing home. Again, the nurses uh, are, are the heroes of this story. It's early 1990, 1991-92. Mrs. Wallace gets a call from, from the nurses. Terry's not right today. Now, vegetative patients aren't, aren't meant to be right or not right. They're just meant to be inert because they don't do anything. The nurses observed that Terry was just a little bit out of sorts. So Terry mother comes in and she finds Terry Wallace with his eyes, you know, like 
like we, we'd say t a technical term, bug eyes, you know, scared, frightened, can't say anything. And what had happened? He was in a nursing home with, a, with an elderly roommate. His elderly roommate, who had advanced dementia, had got tangled up in his sheets and had asphyxiated himself in this little nursing home in Arkansas. And Terry Wallace witnessed that. Couldn't talk, was felt to be inert, felt to be unable to perceive another person's pain, but he was in the room and he saw it. And so we've dedicated ourselves to trying to give these people a voice, um, along with others in the, in the neurology and, and physical medicine uh, and neurosurgical communities. And I think it's an ethical mandate, and I think it's a civil rights issue to improve the care of these patients, make sure they're properly diagnosed, and to give them the prosthetics uh, that they need uh, so that they're able uh, to communicate. And there's a lot more to say about neuroimaging and how that is facilitating our work. But I think in the interest of time and in the interest of wanting to hear what you have to say, I'll stop now and again thank the Cheng family for the opportunity to be honored by, by this name lectureship. Thank you both, all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so we had, we had a meeting at, the, so the question is, uh, um, uh, could I comment on the Mohonk report, uh, which was a report that uh, we, I was a co-author on uh, for the Congressional Brain Injury Caucus, um, and Mo, the Mo, there's a Mohonk Mountain Resort, um, upstate New York, and, and we were all there trying to, to design the optimal system where, where the acute care hospital would be connected with uh, the rehab facilities for acute inpatient rehab and then out into the community to chronic care um, and hubs of activity that would allow for the research to continue. Um, and, and you know, if you have a cancer center, your cancer patients come to your program and they get treated and they just sort of show up, they're there. Our patients are out in the community and there's no reliable information on how many people are in the minimally conscious state. One of the recommendations we made in the IOM report was to go out and do the demographics if you don't know how many people are in the minimally conscious state, um, then there's no way you can do policy planning to meet their needs. Um, and it's been estimated that three to four percent of the 300,000 people who were injured in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are at a level of disorders of consciousness, but you never hear about that. You hear about football players and concussion, but you don't hear about the severe, severe brain injury. So the Mohonk Mountain Report, actually, I, I, they, were, they were arguing over what do we call this report? And I said, well, we're at Mohawk Mountain. <laughs> then we named it Mohawk Mountain Report. Um, but the, the idea was to, to, to make sure that the silos that people operated in are breached and that patients can make seamless uh, trans transitions. 
Uh, I'm actually working on a paper that's due tomorrow for Joe Giacino um, on, a, on a review in Nature. It's going to be in one of the Nature journals about, about disorders of consciousness, and I'm writing it with Joe. Um, Stephen Morris and uh, Nico Schiff, uh, my neurologist colleague, and I'm, and I'm writing about this very question. And, and one of the other challenges is one of the companies um, that actually determines utilization review guidelines want people to be able to uh, make um, function, you know, meaningful recoveries and meaningful progress as a precondition to get into acute rehab. And the problem is that you don't know who the people are who are minimally conscious because the diagnostic error rate is 41%. So the argument that, that we're making in this paper and that, and that John White, another colleague, has made on behalf of the, the ACRM, the, the, the Rehabilitation Society, to, uh, to this company, McKesson, uh, is to say, let's front load the system and let's get people into acute rehab. Let's get their proper diagnosis. Let's see what they've got. It's almost like an audition and then if they, if they don't have, if they haven't progressed far enough, we can send them back into the community and follow them. The opposite argument is, well, let's put them in chronic care and wait for them to get better. But we know if they go into chronic care, they get virtually ignored. So the whole system has to be rejiggered, as it were. And the point is, is that this is, people say to me, oh, you're just going to spend all our money. We don't have money for this. The point is, we're already spending money on custodial care. And, and we were talking about outcomes research earlier at, 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 in their pre-gathering. And, and, you know, the question is, if this stuff begins to work, let's say deep brain stimulation really caught on and it really worked, you could do a cost-benefit analysis, say, well, it costs $40,000 for the stimulator and X amount of money for the surgery and the batteries and yada, 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 but now the person doesn't need, t doesn't need TPN, doesn't need PEG tube feeding, um, is not going to have X number of blood clots in their legs because of immobility. They're not going to have this many pneumonia, pneumonia episodes. And let's tally it all up and do a cost-benefit analysis and let's see if it's actually not only better for people and families, but is it, is it more cost-effective? Uh, the problem is that we don't generally subject phase one studies to cost effect effectiveness uh, standards, and that's because I think of the, the lingering bias against this population that goes back to some of the uh, unintended legacies of the right to die movement. Yes, sir. I really appreciate the talk. Great, great talk. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I love the stories, they're very powerful. Um, but I'll, for helping families work through a situation where they're do we know anything yet about what we can tell them about the chances of their loved ones recovery? You know, I mean, so many of these patients are getting improper care, and those numbers are probably not very helpful. But among people that are getting proper care, what can we expect of what we tell families? Well, I think I think you know um, the the the, uh, uh, the data from Tampa I think is our best data that we have right now. That, that if you have traumatic brain injury and you're in a coma, there's a 20% chance of functional independent recovery. And my point with that, that hurricane cone was, you know, tell them, like for example, tell them, you know, a prognosis for the first month. If, for example, if somebody immediately recovers from a coma into a vegetative state very quickly, that's clearly not as good as just waking up. But it's better than being in a coma for two weeks. Why? Because it suggests the brainstem recovered first. However, if you're still in that state at a month, it's now a persistent vegetative state, and that's not good. So break it up into pieces and give people information that's, that's, that's evidence-based as you go along. The other thing we did not have a chance to talk about is the role of imaging. And, and neuroimaging can also help uh, sometimes be a tiebreaker. These are still investigational. But, but the other big challenge that we have is we have behavioral uh, methods to assess patients, and we have an emerging use of, of neuro, neuroimaging, and you can have a discordance. Somebody is vegetative on the exam, but, but they actually flare on the, the fMRI. And I've called that in the literature, as my, Nico Schiff and I have coined this as non-behavioral MCS, that you actually have um, evidence of, of uh, responsiveness on the fMRI, uh, which would countervene a, a vegetative diagnosis, but you don't have the behavioral manifestations. So all these tools are beginning to kind of coalesce. I think the key thing is to get, you know, your patient to this gentleman here and his program where there's true expertise, because the best evaluation is the use of what's called the coma recovery scale, R,
which is a neuropsychological test that requires uh, expertise and multiple exams. Multiple exams because these behaviors are episodic and if you're in, if you're in between the flickers, you're not going to see it. So it's really, it's really a, you know, very much um, you know, user dependent and you really want to have um, uh, an expert making that assessment. And the stakes are huge. If you put this person in the wrong bin, they end up in a nursing home for the rest of their lives. Conscious, perhaps, and mistaken as being not. And I think that's, that's, that's a, a huge you know, error that should be intolerable in my, in my framework. Just, just to follow up, I think you were responding to sort of the, the acute questions. I'm concerned about the 41% that are still in the nursing home right, right now. Yeah. We, you know, we're going to have loved ones who are learning about these wonderful cases, and they're going to want to know, well, my family member has been in this nursing home for five, six, ten years. Right. What should we hope then? We well, I think, I think, I think that that was if I had if I had money to spend on. I want to make sure, as I said, I said this earlier, I want to make sure that everybody who's been classified as vegetative truly is vegetative. Uh, and I think that those people are going to have to be evaluated. We're going to have a prevalence problem in addition to our incidence problem because we have an accumulation of these people where we know there's, there's a lot of mis misdiagnosis. We are the main character in my book. Should I ruin it for you or not? Should I ruin the book? Ruin it. I mean, she came to us labeled as being, I, actually this is going to be on YouTube, so I can't, iTubes or whatever it's called, um, iPad land. I don't want this to be, I won't blow, I'll tell you afterwards, okay? But <laughs> let's just say the diagnosis changed, okay, over time. Yes, sir. One last question. Yeah. So basically I think all these cases demonstrate the long-term follow-up is more important than the cross-section diagnosis. So if you follow a case where long-term you see the patient improve, whatever the diagnosis You know, I think I think uh, I think what we have to do is um, there's nothing that we know of that families can do uh, independent of just talking to, to patients and, and letting them know that they care uh, and and to give them the opportunity to, um, to to demonstrate these behaviors and that it's properly observed and then once we have those behaviors to find them assistive devices you know, like an, an, an eagle eye or something. I mean, and it's very inexpensive to get people set up with, uh, with, a, with a computer um, and a tracking device and a word board. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, you know our, our patient, uh, I'll got ruin it for her, you know, she, she came to us as vegetative. Uh, we evaluated her. She turned out she's minimally conscious. And, and now she's using a, a software that's off the shelf, less than $50, and able to communicate with her one eye that, that actually moves. Uh, kind of like the diving bell and the butterfly, except she's got cognitive impairment uh, probably as well as um, more than just a locked-in state. So I think that the key point is to, is to get these resources to families. It's also important to let families know when patients are permanently vegetative uh, so that they can, they can make other decisions uh, about closure if patients aren't going to recover. Um, but I think you know, we, have, we have an undersupply of of physiatry uh, expertise, we have uh, we don't have the national will for this population, and I think um, you know um, we have to begin to appreciate the reason I wrote this book with with interviewing some 40 families and telling this main story and these other f stories is so that you begin to think of these people as people. You know, if you think of them as people, they 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 gain rights. If you think of of them as merely the disabled, uh, they they they're, they're they're anonymous and they're invisible. You know, I thought the Americans with Disabilities Act would, would you know, why, why doesn't it cover these people? It's because these people are still perceived as not even being disabled. They're just other. They're vegetative. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a category from Aristotle, uh, you know, from, from De Animus. So these people have been out of our gaze. They've been out of our, we're not interested in them. And, and there's a tremendous toll, toll on families and care burden of caregiving.
and and I think we just we have we owe it to 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 these minds, these families, to to give people one a credible diagnosis, two uh, assistive devices, three um, drugs that are being increasingly used. If you go into your Louisville uh, Disorder of Consciousness program, you know you'll be assessed. You'll get you'll get a drug trial with a a, a mantadine um, and some other and uh, other interventions to to try to jumpstart whatever whatever cognitive ability is there. And then once you do that, the most amazing thing happens. The brain takes care of itself. Um, the brain, which has been quiescent and ignored for you know years or months, uh, begins to make contact with you. Our patient, the morning after we, we ran into the room and, and we realized that she was recognizing people in the room and she was not vegetative, the next morning we walked into the room and she was blinking on her own. As if to say, don't forget, I'm here, I'm here. Don't, rem don't forget, don't forget. Um, and so I think um, the, the brain, the brain uh, you know, it's like cochlear implants. You know, you put a cochlear implant and it somehow knows how to connect itself. Um, I think there's a lot of capacity. Instead of focusing on what's not there, you've got the most sophisticated tool in the universe that we know of, um, and let's focus on what's left and try to maximize that cognitive capability. And I think as we learn about the circuits, these, these, these problems as circuit disorders, we'll have less heterogeneity of outcome, we'll have circuit-based diagnoses, and we'll have circuit-based interventions um, that will really maximize outcomes. And, and, and I'm, I'm telling you stuff right now that when I was a medical student was absolutely inconceivable. All the catechisms that I was taught in neurology and in bioethics, okay, um, are breached by what I've just told you in the last hour. So this is just the beginning, and I think if we stay tuned to the science and, and we fund it, um, and we care about these people as we should, um, um, you know, this is just the beginning. Um, Fred Plum, I'll end with this saying, Fred Plum, who was one of my teachers and one of my mentors, um, you know, talking to Dr. Schiff and myself at lunch one day, and he, he's a man who, who just passed away a couple years ago, he said to me, he said, he said, I wish I was a young man, because all the science that, that he, he helped to found, um, you know, is going to come to fruition, and I wish I were a younger man, because there's so much more that's going to happen, and we're just at the beginning if we allow ourselves to you know, let this work uh, thrive. But I thank you for having the chance to share some of it with you, and I'll come up here if you want to ask some more questions, and again, thank you to the family for the opportunity to be here. Thank you.